Let's begin a biblical timeline. Abraham's date on the timeline, about 2000 BC. Throughout our study, most dates will be presented in large, rounded groupings of 500 year increments. More precise dating is not needed in this particular study. The memory tool, a judge must judge, brings to mind Abraham, the first of the four great people, right after the creation file folder. Here is Abraham's folder in the Bible file lineup. Starting in chapter 12 of Genesis, the quick chronology of the Bible focuses on Ur of the Chaldees, the U on the map of the ancient Near East. Its setting is in the rich, fertile crescent of the Middle East. The stage of the great drama stretches from the Euphrates Valley all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea. This region has been called the very navel of the earth. Through this great hinge of history, time and again, great world powers of the past have marched in conquest, with Canaan, Palestine, Israel being pulled and stretched by enormous international and internal pressures. The story of Abraham begins near at the head of the Persian Gulf, in that ancient city, Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham and his family lived in this early cultural center in the Mesopotamian basin. If you'd like to, follow along by tracing on your own map as the story begins to unfold. Here is the map of this region in today's world. Remember that this was the stage of the earlier Persian Gulf War of the 1990s, and more recently, the war in Iraq that toppled Saddam Hussein. There is the familiar Tigris River, and the Euphrates, today's city of Baghdad. Kuwait stands at the head of the Persian Gulf. To the north, the location of ancient Babylon, and the beginning point of our story, the ancient city of Ur. Here in this Middle Eastern land, bordering the Persian Gulf, were some of the earliest beginnings of mankind's discovery of an intellectual life. In this triangular-shaped valley, called the Mesopotamian Basin, the ancient Sumerians presented us the gifts of writing and the wheel. And here we see the beginnings of basic concepts of civilization, of law, of medicine, of astronomy and architecture. Archaeologists have also found evidence of some of the very earliest urban centers, the communities and the cities that, through time, have led directly to the civilization and cultures we know today. This kind of temple tower, or ziggurat, was common in that region in Abraham's day in Ur of the Chaldees. In 2000 BC, Ur was a great city, an international center of learning, culture, commerce, and also idolatrous spiritual darkness. The biblical narrative tells us about a man named Abraham living with his family in ancient Ur of the Chaldees. In the family was his aging father, Terah. Terah's son named Abram, later to be renamed by God, Abraham, as his future place in history is made clear. Abraham's wife's name was Sarah, originally Sarai. Also in this family group was Abraham's nephew, Lot. We begin with Abraham's file folder. Abraham's story opens in Genesis 12 and forward. The time frame is about 2000 BC. He is the first of the four great people. It is through this one man, Abraham, that God begins a new program to provide for his creation the way back to that original, intimate relationship that existed with mankind in the beginning. Through Abraham unfolds all the rest of the Bible until we see in the book of Revelation, once again, the broad view of the world and the universe. This great story begins in the 12th chapter of Genesis, where Abraham receives God's call telling him to leave Ur and go toward a land that will be shown to him in due time. This is the most crucial biblical event in the life of the old patriarch and also the beginning point in the revelation of God's new program with man. On your worksheet, it's represented by the letters AC inside the image of a scroll. AC is to remind us of the great Abrahamic covenant, provided for us in our own Bibles at Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. It is an unconditional covenant promise. On Abraham's file folder, add the letters L, S, 
B, standing for the words land, seed, and blessing. Here is the significance of those words. Right there in the book of Genesis, 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3, God makes that unconditional covenant promise to Abraham, later to become an actual legal contract in the culture of that day. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, God presents his three-part promise to Abraham. Here it is. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The order of those covenant promises is an important key to biblical order itself. First is the promise of a land, then a seed, followed by a blessing, represented by LSB on the Abraham file folder. Now, study this plan of organization, the down-to-earth meaning of those three promises, the LSB on Abraham's folder. First, promise number one, Genesis 12:1, a land, real estate, a geographic inheritance that most Jewish people respect politically to this present day. Promise number two, Genesis 12:2. A seed, a long line of descendants, especially interesting because at the time the promise is given, Abraham and Sarah are approaching old age, and yet they have never had children. The final promise, number three, Genesis 12, 3, a blessing promised to Abraham personally and to his descendants. Furthermore, God promises that through his blessing to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed, not just Abraham's descendants. Notice that wording. It's an important key to understanding God's grace. Now to the basic outline of the promise, LSB, for land, seed, and blessing. We can also add these basic concepts. Three additional ideas that describe the characteristics of that Abrahamic promise. First, that great promise was and is literal in that the words mean exactly what they say. It is also eternal, an unending arrangement guaranteed by the maker of the contract, God himself. And finally, it is unconditional, indicating that no matter what Abraham or his descendants might do in the future, God would, in time, repeat in time, fulfill every element of his promises. As we move farther through this story, we'll come to see how the entire Bible is built on that set of unconditional and foundational promises, soon to become a legal contract between God and his friend, Abraham. After Abraham receives God's promises, the entire family leaves Ur of the Chaldees to follow the Lord's direction. They move toward the Northwest with all their flocks and their possessions probably a large congregation of people, animals, and tents. Biblical evidence shows Abraham's family was probably wealthy. The main point here is this. Abraham and his family left in faith. They are moving toward a land that God will show them in due time. But as they leave Ur of the Chaldees, they do not know their destination. Their obedience is a profound demonstration of their faith in God's provision and His total protection as they head out into the unknown under Abraham's leadership. It is entirely possible that they passed through the region of ancient Babylon, upriver from Ur, that city in which Abraham's descendants, the Jews, would be held prisoner in the centuries to follow. They continue northwestward, finally arriving at ancient Haran, still in existence today in modern Turkey. While settled temporarily in Haran, Abraham's father Terah dies. Once again, God speaks to Abraham, instructing him to now leave Haran and move onward toward the land he had promised to show him. That land is Canaan, or the land we call Israel today. When he enters the land, Abraham is already 75 years old, and his wife Sarah is 65, and yet God has promised them children. What? Was God teasing the old couple? 
children promised at that age? Yes, Abraham continues to believe God's promise of a land, a seed, and a blessing. His simple, unquestioning belief is told to us in Genesis 15, 6, where God counts that belief as righteousness on Abraham's part. Just simple belief. This is the first step in the new program of redemption God will introduce to the earth through his old friend. Abraham truly believes that God will accomplish what he has promised, and the years pass. In spite of God's clear promise, Abraham and Sarah become impatient as they wait for the children God had promised them. In her impatience, Sarah suggests that Abraham go into her Egyptian servant girl, Hagar, hoping that through that union, the promised child might be born. That was not unusual in the culture of their day. Indeed, in time, Abraham does father a son through Hagar. The boy is named Ishmael. But God says the infant is not the intended son of his covenant promise to Abraham's descendants. By now, Abraham is 85, Sarah 75. After another 15 years, the son of God's promise to Abraham is finally born through Sarah. He is named Isaac, a word that traces its meaning to the Hebrew root term indicating laughter. Yes, Abraham thinks it's hilarious that he and Sarah are to become parents at such advanced ages. Isaac is indeed the long-awaited son through whom God's promise to Abraham is to be passed down through his family line. So, the letters I and I appear on Abraham's file folder. From these two sons of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac, Right here at this critical historic point, the terrible Jewish-Arab conflict of our own time begins some 4,000 years ago, around 2000 BC. Because Ishmael is recognized today as the father of the Arab nations through Abraham, while Isaac, of course, is revered as one of the founding patriarchs of the Jews, also through Abraham. There is enormous conflict between the two half-brothers and their mothers. And as we watch or read today's news, we see how that age-old turmoil that began in Abraham's tent 4,000 years ago continues today. Both the Jews and the Arabs claim Abraham as the beginning point of their respective peoples. The question then arises, how do we know which son was really the inheritor of the Abrahamic promises? Look at Genesis 22 too. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Look at this study note from the NIV translation. In Hebrew text, Isaac follows the clause, whom you love, in order to heighten the effect, your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Isaac was the only son of the promise. Here also you'll find in 2 Chronicles 3, 1, that God identifies Moriah with the Temple Mount, which today is the site of the Muslim Dome of the Rock. We'll cover more on that subject later. But Ishmael was not completely forgotten, not at all. Genesis 17, 20 through 21, And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. It's interesting to compare those gifts today. Generally speaking, here are the lands populated today by the descendants of Ishmael, the Arab lands of the Middle East. But then compare that with the descendants of Isaac in the Middle East, right there in tiny Israel. Why the enormous difference? Practically speaking, just compare the geography. Today's Israel versus the rest of the Arab world. But there is something else at work here. Compare the Middle Eastern influence of Ishmael's descendant, Mohammed, founder of Islam, with that of Isaac, the great Israelite patriarch and the brother of Ishmael. In today's geopolitical world, compare the size of tiny Israel with Australia, Israel with France, Israel and the United States state of Maine, or Israel and California. 
And finally, even when Israel is compared to the entire United States, from the north to the south, from the east to the west, when it comes to size alone, there is enormous disparity between Isaac and Ishmael. Why is this so? How can we explain it? Look at this passage from Hal Lindsey's book, The Everlasting Hatred, The Roots of Jihad. The Ishmaelites were given more land and ultimately more wealth than Israelites. This was true in their past history, not to mention the vast oil wealth of modern times, and spiritual salvation has always been open to the Ishmaelites. But God's covenant, which concerned His spiritual purposes, was only for Isaac and his descendants. The physical blessings promised to Isaac were to facilitate God's spiritual call for the nation that would come from him. And inside the ancient land right now, here the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael continue today, that endless conflict that began in Abraham's tent in ancient Palestine or Canaan or Israel so long ago. Jewish Israel is engulfed by the descendants of Ishmael in surrounding countries on all sides. The implications of that circumstance in our own time are enormous. The story now begins to move much faster. Isaac, Abraham's son through Sarah, is the son of God's promise. Isaac then has two sons, Jacob and Esau, J and E on the Abraham file folder. Jacob is the son through whom the unconditional promise now continues. Jacob in turn has 12 sons, the number 12 on the Abraham folder. So then the line of the promise is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob. Here is a graphic representation of those 12 sons of Jacob, born to him and his four wives across the long years of his life. You'll see there was also a thirteenth child, one daughter. From those twelve sons of old Jacob emerged the twelve tribes of Israel. But notice one particular son of Jacob, number eleven, one of his youngest and probably the most remembered of all his children. This son's story is familiar to almost everyone. His name is Joseph. This great man of legendary character, his name known throughout the ages, connects us to the next of the four biblical personalities in this mental map of the biblical storyline. Now we've completed the second folder in the Bible file collection. First is creation, followed by Abraham, the first of the four great names. Now time to move forward to the second in the group of four great Old Testament characters, the Bible file folder number three. From a judge must judge, we know that his name begins with the letter J, which is Joseph. Probably no biblical character is more famous, more legendary than this one man, who through his sterling character and his integrity before God, changed all of human history. Now let's examine Joseph's folder in the Bible file lineup. Remember our mnemonic device, a judge must judge. The first J brings to mind Joseph. The Joseph folder is ready for two significant events to be filled in. The young man is well loved by his father, Jacob, so deeply and obviously, in fact, that it arouses the envy of most of his brothers. Tending flocks at that time in the fields near today's Dothan in northern Israel, the brothers plot against Joseph, selling him into slavery to a passing caravan on its way to Egypt. Once in Egypt, among the fabulous wealth and wonders of that advanced civilization, and after several difficult personal trials, Joseph is soon discovered to be a brilliant young man with enormous administrative ability. He learns quickly while remaining faithful and obedient to God's authority and leading in his life. In time, Joseph rises in Egyptian civil authority. He becomes governor of all of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh himself. At this same time, back in Canaan, famine strikes the land. In order to survive the crisis, Joseph's father, old Jacob, now called Israel, sends some of the brothers to Egypt to buy grain. Through a series of dramatic events, told in great detail in the latter chapters of Genesis, the brothers learn that their sibling Joseph is now the governor of Egypt. 
The family follows from Canaan and decides to settle in Egypt permanently. And there, as a family of Hebrews, they begin to multiply into a nation to be known through later history as the Israelites. For a while, they remain in good favor with the Egyptian people and the government administration. After all, they are the family of their respected governor. We can climb the side of the Great Pyramid of Giza today and wonder, are these the quarries where Joseph's family later slaved through the centuries? Maybe so. Some evidence points in that direction. As time passed and Joseph died, these ancient wonders would have seen the throne of Egypt undergo changes of attitude and a loss of respect for the alien Hebrews, or the Israelites, the old family of Joseph. After his death, Joseph's long service to Egypt is soon forgotten. While at the same time, as a population, the Israelites are multiplying rapidly, having lots and lots of children. Soon becoming an enormous social problem and a serious national threat to their Egyptian overlords. To take care of that problem, the Israelites, Joseph's national descendants, become slaves to the Egyptians. Israelites are in Egypt for some 430 years. Much of that time is lived out under the terrible bondage of Egyptian slave masters. Let's quickly review the entries in these two Bible files. You should have five reminders in your Abraham folder. The call. God calls Abraham to leave his home in Ur and travel to a foreign land. LSB. Abraham receives God's covenant promises of the land, a seed, and a blessing. I, I, Abraham's two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, recognized today as the patriarchs of the Arab nations and the Jews. J, E, Jacob and Esau, the sons of Isaac. Jacob will change his name to Israel and father the sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel. The Joseph folder should contain two mental notes, slavery, after Joseph brings his family to Egypt, his influence is gradually forgotten and the Israelites become slaves of the Egyptians. 430. The Israelites endure over four centuries of bondage. You now have three of the ten Bible file folders completed. In our next lesson, we'll discuss the third person in the group of four great biblical personalities. This great person, the large capital M, is Moses.